you know, there's something about that hungry heart that Jesus loves. There's something about that cry that comes from deep inside of us that God loves. It's the cry of David saying, my heart and my flesh long for you. It's the cry of Simon Peter that says, Lord, where else can I go? You are the one that has the words of eternal life. It's the words of Moses saying, Lord, without your presence, don't send us up from this place. What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? Show me your glory. You know, I don't think for one moment that God ever intended to send Moses up without his presence. In fact, the previous verse right before Moses makes that request, the Lord specifically says to him, I will go with you, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. But you have to hear in that cry of Moses, the heart of Moses. You see, this desire for the presence of the Lord was not some secondary, incidental, ancillary issue for him. It was the primary heart of everything that he was concerned about. That's why he grabbed a hold of that promise and he said, Lord, if your presence doesn't go with us, nothing else matters. I don't care how many resources we have, how many people we have, how many supplies we have. Lord, without your presence, don't send us up from this place. And you know, the Lord was not put off by that at all. There's something about that that God loved. You see, the, the cry that we're singing about for more, it's not the cry of some rich glutton pounding on the table demanding God to do something. It's the cry of a helpless baby crying out for the milk that its mother gives because you see that baby knows that without the milk it won't have the nourishment that it needs to live without that milk the baby will simply die and the heart of of those of us who cry out for more is the heart that says god without your presence if you don't go with us our lives are meaningless our lives are nothing david the psalmist he said lord if if you are silent unto me i will be like those that go down to the pit lord with you it's heaven without you it's hell that's our prayer Jesus himself said without me you can do nothing I want you to listen very carefully to the way he said that he didn't say without me you can't do anything that would be a different claim he said without me you can do nothing you know the truth is there are a lot of things we can do without him we can do work without him. We can do family without him. We can do life without him. We can even do ministry without him. We can build churches and empires. We can preach, we can pray, we can sing without him. But at the end of the day, all of those things that are done without him, they amount to nothing more than sand castles on the beach that are here today and they're gone tomorrow. Without him, it all amounts to nothing. That's why he says, without me, you can do nothing. You know, a while back, I was in a, a meeting where the Holy Spirit had moved in such an extraordinary, powerful way, one of the most powerful things I'd ever seen in my life. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me in that moment, something I'll never forget. He said, I will never send anyone away empty unless they come full of themselves. And I wonder how often we come to him wondering why we haven't received what we want to receive and the reason is because we're already full of ourselves, full of our preconceived expectations and ideas and full of our, our pride and sometimes even full of our theology and our doctrine that puts him in a box and tries to define him and subject him to our rules and regulations. But you see, God is looking for people whose hearts are so hungry for him that they're willing to say, Lord, I don't care what it looks like. I don't care if my denomination agrees with it. I don't care if it even fits all of my theology. I want you above everything. Lord, if your presence isn't there, nothing else matters anyway. The buildings, the, the trappings, all of the presentation, it's nothing without you. So Lord, first and foremost, I say, give us your presence. We need you above everything. This is the discovery that Elisha made. When he picked up that mantle of Elijah, you know, that mantle was the sign, the symbol of, of the office that he had received from his mentor. It was a, a symbol of authority. It was a symbol of a promotion. He was now the leader of Elijah's ministry, the president of Elijah's Bible school of the prophets. But Elisha had not even made it down the mountain before he reached an obstacle that would not bow to his new title. 
the Red Sea was there and the Red Sea didn't care about his title, didn't care about his office, it didn't care about his promotion. And that's the moment, the first moment that Elisha realized that if he was going to be able to walk in the footsteps of Elijah, he was going to need more than Elijah's mantle, he was going to need Elijah's God. So he lifted that mantle and he struck the water and he cried out words that have rung through history. Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Because you see, we have to get to a point where titles and positions and promotions and pedigree and offices and heritage, these things aren't enough for us. Having a wonderful heritage is a good thing, but if that heritage becomes a substitute for God's presence, then we have been robbed of the even greater thing. Elisha could have done very well in his life as the leader of Elijah's ministry, as the, as the president of the Bible school of the prophets. He would, have had, he would have had lots of recognition in the land. He would have had a position. But his exploits would not have been biblical. He would not have changed the nation. We wouldn't be talking about him now. The reason we know about Elisha is not because he caught Elijah's mantle, but because he found Elijah's God. This is the lesson that Jacob learned. You know, it amazes me what God looks for in people. It's very different than what we look for. In the book of Malachi, the Lord said something amazing. He says, Jacob I've loved, but Esau I've hated. Jacob was not the kind of character that we would think of as a nice guy, a good boy. His name means supplanter and deceiver, and that's exactly what he was. He was a trickster, he was a crook. But God saw something in Jacob that he loved. It was that Jacob had, and he carried with him through his entire life, this deep longing and this deep yearning for something. I don't even think he knew what it was, but he was hungry all the time. And that's why when he saw Esau, he thought maybe what he needed was the birthright. And so he defrauded his older brother Esau out of the birthright. But when he got it, it just didn't fulfill his soul. So he kept looking. And then he thought, well, maybe it's, maybe it's the, the blessing of my father, Isaac. And so, you know the story, how he went to Isaac and he put the hair on his arm so that he would, he would seem like, like Esau. And he tricked his father out of the blessing. But when he got it, he said, this isn't it. This isn't what my soul is crying for. But one day, we read the story that he grabbed a hold of the angel of the Lord. And when he grabbed a hold of the angel of the Lord, he realized something. This was it. This is what he had been searching for his entire life. And that's why he said to that angel, listen, I've been looking for this. I've been searching for this. And finally I found it. And I will not let you go until you bless me. I think sometimes when we read that story, we put the emphasis on the wrong word. We put the emphasis on I will not let you go or, or maybe bless me. But I think the emphasis was on the word you. Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What he was saying was, I've had all the other blessings. I've had the blessing of my brother Esau. I had the, the blessing of my grandfather Abraham. I've had the blessing of my father Isaac, but none of those things have fulfilled me. I want your blessing. I want you. Because he pressed in and he took hold of God himself. We don't just say that our God is the God of Abraham and Isaac. We say that he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is what God is looking for. Hearts that are not satisfied with anything else. And this is the choice that we have to make every day. Because we can be satisfied with many other things. Especially when we live comfortable lives and we're surrounded by conveniences and we're surrounded by comfortable Christianity. We could be satisfied with religion, we could be satisfied with convenience, but there is a people that is going to intentionally push all of that away and say, Lord, we refuse to be satisfied with anything less than your presence. Come on, lift your hands and just begin to cry to the Lord, Father, we want you. We say as your people and as your children that we want you, we desire you, we need you. Lord, we will not allow our hearts to be satisfied with anything less. Lord, we say you are our great reward. You are the one that we have been searching for. No mantle will suffice. No title will suffice. No heritage will suffice. The only thing that will satisfy our hearts. 